Happy Sabbath. Um, this old world has a lot of old traditions. Um, for instance, like at a birthday party, uh, you ask the person that has the birthday, what do they do with the candles that went after they're lit? Make a wish, blow them out, and what are you supposed to never do? Tell your wish. I don't understand that. How are parents supposed to help a wish come true if they don't know it? So anyway, so it's, it's funny, the different types of tradition. Another thing that is a tradition along this time of year is um, New Year resolutions. Yeah, we're, I, I'm, yeah I'm hearing, ugh, because we've all done that, and what was the results? They failed, yeah. Or wished we had never made the resolution to begin with, right? And that's why we come to this time of year and we think, I ain't going to ever do that again. What's the sense in it? But the, today the talk is, and we're going to consider a story, is the possibility of making a New Year's resolution that can apply daily a, into our lives and that we can have the assurance of it taking place. And the unusual place to find this is going to be in the Old Testament. And of course, I could have probably chosen many stories, but I thought I'd share this one with you because I think we as a movement, we believe we have a particular message and one of those particular areas of our message is called, it has a title even, it's called the Elijah message. So it, I'm just curious, if, if I was to ask for a show of hands, how many of you know what the Elijah message is? Some, some, after last Sabbath, there's probably most of you afraid to raise your hand because there was a young man that raised his hand, and I called on him with three questions, right? So I hope that nobody has that fear because, uh, you know, we should be aware of the Elijah message. We have it. Even the disciples, when Jesus asked them, who do they say that I am, you know, he... he they responded, uh, you know, he asked them the question, they responded, one of the names that they mentioned was Elijah. So there's a special message for each one of these prophets that we should have today. But the key today is, I don't think is the message itself, because we can get wrapped up in the life of Elijah and say, oh, we need to be standing like on Mount Carmel and saying, choose ye this day. And that, that's a key point of the message, right? But my prayer request, and my, uh, my prayer is for you, that you will make a New Year's resolution to prepare your heart and mind to take that stand. I'm going to say that again to make sure we're on the same page. We need to be connected with Him in such a way that when an opportunity comes up, we're ready to use that word or that phrase, choose ye this day in a manner or in a way that it connects to the person he's brought us in front of. I'll share with you a story in the close of what I mean by that because it's happened to us just recently. So let's open our Bibles. We're going to start here in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, and somebody here already is thinking, oh, we're going to talk about Elijah today. Yes, Already started that, so we're just going to continue. So, maybe I should ask this question. I can't help it. How many of you saw the title of that's in the bulletin? Healthy start. Okay, so we're going to, about to start a new year, and my desire is that you have a healthy start. And probably somebody was thinking. Maybe I should ask this in a question. What did you think this was going to be about? The health message? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an honest answer. But I heard something else. What was it? New Year's resolutions. Okay, healthy start. Okay, so here we go. Um, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we're about to consider your word. And we know that there are so many different levels 
to consider and be convicted, but we're asking for you to bring us home to a clear understanding of our desperate need of you and that you are willing to supply that need daily. And it even gets pretty exciting when we consider the fact that you have already supplied that need through your son. But as we consider the life of Elijah, bring to us individually what you have in store for us collectively is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gil, uh, Gilead, said unto Ahab, now who's Ahab? The king of Israel. As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, how would you like the job of being sent by God to stand before the king and tell him it ain't going to rain? I, that would just thrill my soul. Not. Okay, so the point is that the setting is very unusual and and this is the way Elijah comes on the scene. I'm going to use a phrase until we get on the cloud together that we are all in school. Okay? Elijah is in school here. Even though I love telling people that we're about to, once we get on the cloud, we're actually going to start another thousand years of school. But right now, sitting at his feet, yeah, but right now we're all in school and, and it's not just a big Sabbath school class I'm talking about. We are on a journey individually and Elijah, his school just began. He got a call from God. I want you to go to Ahab, give him this message. And this, this is the love of God to me. Don't stick around and debate the issue with him. Just give the message. That's all I'm asking you to do. Now, I, to me, that, I, that's a hallelujah thing to me. You know, I don't have to stick around and say, well, and listen to, I, I, I hear, I see Ahab hearing the message, huh? And while he's saying, huh, he's gone. You know, so what happens next is to help Elijah prepare for his ministry. Because the name Elijah means, my God is Jehovah. But he's got to learn that. So he goes to a place, and uh, verse 2, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, I just wondered, how many of you would like to experience that? Okay, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith. It is before Jordan. Okay, the name Cherith in the Hebrew means a cutting place. A cutting place. So that means God sent this prophet, this young prophet, prophet just getting started in the new job in his life he sent him to a cutting place now it wasn't a place where we're talking uh, a knife and cutting away stuff this is God's scalpel cutting away old Elijah does that make sense it's cutting away his ability or his ways of defending self so that he might can be used to give the next message that's, da that's yet to come. So here's the key for today's talk. Wait a minute, I got one. Y'all got your key with you? You've already got the keys, right? Okay. Oh, I love it. I see some. This is great. So you got your keys from last Sabbath. So here's a, here's a key to you. That in school, we shouldn't be focusing on 
pain, hurt. We need to realize the process that he's leading us through is to save us. And, in Elijah's case, and to prepare us to give a message that is clear. Not wishy-washy, but thus saith the Lord. Elijah himself even needed to go to school and learn that. He was sent to this cutting place. First of all, step one. When the Lord speaks, you act. That's point one. The Lord spoke to him, and he went. And he did. Not only going to Ahab and giving a message, but the word of the Lord came to him again, said, go to the brook, and he went. There's a fascinating point here in verse 3. Uh, it says, that is before Jordan. The brook Cherith is actually on a, a high raised area of land. That if you were to walk away from the brook a little ways, you could look down into the valley and guess what you see? The river Jordan. So here is a little bit of water sustaining his life in sight of a lot of water. And at that location, God chooses to do something pretty fascinating with him. How does God sustain him besides water? The ravens. And the ravens, uh, let's see, verse 4, And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I will command the ravens to feed thee there. And he went and did according to the word, and he went and dwelt by the brook that, was, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh. When? Morning and in the evening. It's really fascinating in Scripture when those two times are placed together. We're supposed to be thinking of the morning and evening sacrifices. We're supposed to be thinking of the bread of life. And the plan that God has already established or put in place to save us from this whole world. So it wasn't just manna or whatever it was. It was to consider mentally of God saving him. Morning and evening. And then verse 7, And it came to pass after a while that... What happened to the brook? Dried up. Because there had been no rain in the land. So, stand with me on that little rise of property. A little creek that has been sustaining you for a few years. Dries up. And what can you see in the distance? So, I, I have to ask you this question. How many of you would be tempted to go to the river? There are some hands here. This is reality. You see it in the distance. But you are commanded by God to stay. You know, for most of us, that's hard. Especially, what is that old saying? The grass is always greener on the other side. We see what looks nice and appears to be nice, but yet... That doesn't mean that it's God's will to go there. Sidebar. I feel so blessed to be here. I have felt nothing but love and encouragement since I've walked in this door. Amen. Becky and I both. So, we love you, Bass Academy. But I feel like we're here for such a time as this. Okay, because my prayer is that I, I bring to you a new diet or emphasize a new diet, a new year's resolution. All I want is Jesus. That's all I want. 
And I want him to be the one in charge of my schooling and the process of how I learn about his love, how I learn to depend on him. Because I, old Larry, he raises his ugly head from time to time, and I see grass greener somewhere, and I say, you know, that new Subaru really looks nice. Y'all are laughing because you can relate. You know? But anyway, Elijah stayed put. He did not yield to the temptation of something nicer. Okay? Something, he just waited. Are you ready to do that? Because here is the patience of the saints. There's a reason that verse is in Revelation. And Elijah message is a part of that. Okay? So this is what he does next because God tells him to do it. And this is in verse 8. And the word of the Lord came to him. Can we say the word again here? And get thee to Zarephath. Now, I love the, God's humor. It's one thing for the armies of Ahab to be looking for Elijah, and they are seeing the ravens circling, which, you know, we could think of another bird, vultures. We see those birds of prey circling up there. Well, there ain't nothing but death up there. I'm not going to go look for Elijah there, Right? That's, I just have to get tickled the way God does things. And then he sends him to Zarephath. Just curious, how many of you, by a show of hands, how many of you know whose home is Zarephath? Whose home is Zarephath? Who came from, oh, I see a couple hands. Well, we can, I can give you that answer. It's just back another chapter. Um, in uh, chapter 16, Verse uh, 31. It's talking about Ahab and who he married. So who did he marry? Jezebel. And the daughter of... Thabel. Isn't it funny that his name is actually a derivative of the prophet Bel? King of Zidonians. And Zidonians is where Zidon is. Because... Go to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, which you're talking about now, the home or the area where Jezebel is from. So the soldiers that worked for, were working for Ahab, they wouldn't go there because Elijah's not so stupid to go there. Right? We don't no need to look there. But he arose... And went because there was a widow there to sustain him. Big thing Elijah is learning. Listen to the word of the Lord. Because maybe I should say it this way in the last days, there's going to be a drought for hearing the word of the Lord. It's one thing for there to be a drought to respond to the word of the Lord, but we're talking in Scripture about a drought of hearing the word of the Lord. I want to hear it. And, I'm, and I, I need to practice the Elijah message in that if I hear it, I need to act upon it. If I'm handed a list to visit somebody or a, or a note, this person needs a visit. Is that on, now on the top of my list or do I put it at the bottom? It's on the top. Because God is called or I'm hearing a cry. I need encouragement. Or I need help. God calls us. We must obey. If we're going to say we got the Elijah message. So he rose and went to Zarephath. And the characteristics of, <clears throat> I'm just curious, if, have you ever 
been requested to go meet somebody in a new location and you've been given a very generic description of the person you're going to meet. I mean, just with what I told you, I'd be getting anxious. How am I going to spot this person? It's like getting off an airplane and, and you're going to meet a person that has a coat on. You know what I mean? You go, he was told to go to a city and there's a widow there. There's a key. You ready for another key? This widow, because he's watching all the ladies, you know. He's watching. He doesn't know whose widows are married, right? But he sees a woman with two sticks. You say, Pastor, big deal. Got to have two sticks, at least two sticks to start a fire. Don't, everything's symbolic in the word. Are you hearing the word today? This woman knows about the Messiah. Believes what two sticks are going to be used for in the future. Because the priest took two sticks and opened the chest of that lamb in the shape of a cross. You don't talk about two sticks and just say whoopee doo. You know what I'm saying? This was his sign. This is the one that believes in the good news. This is the one that God has called to help God save me. I'm just curious, are you ready for this diet? I would hope all of us would be saying yes because we just discussed two sticks representing the gospel. Are you ready to hear the word of the Lord? I'm ready for the drought to end, aren't you? I mean, in Sabbath school class, when something is mentioned, like this morning about the sea, there are two ways to consider that, right, Miss Wanda? The... What's underneath the water? Even the disciples were scared to death of dying when the storm came up, right? Because they would go into the sea and die. Don't you care that we die? Or do we want to focus on the one that can stand on top, of, above the doubt and the fear and the unbelief? He's standing there and calling, come. Come. Elijah believes. He's learning to believe because he's in school. I'll say it that way. I'm emphasizing this part of the life of Elijah because it's before this major event happens at Mount Carmel. When Everyone is called together to make a choice. To choose ye this day whom you will serve. The ones making the call are the ones that have been listening to the voice. Have been responding to the voice. Acting upon it in such a way that others believe because of what's been happening. Becky and I was asked to go for a certain visit. Um, the visit was of an elderly lady. Some of you might know her. And she was with her family. Uh, this was years ago. And she's riding in the back seat of her car, and she chokes on some food. Is that right? She gets choked. And the result is that before the family realizes what's happening in the back seat, she has a physical condition now. It's like a, what is it, like a stroke? 
she had a stroke. This happened 19 years ago. And she's been in this home down in Cookville. Now, down there, she's a, a ways away from this church family, and there's only a few that know the story. Now, your past pastor has a gift of visitation. But apparently, this lady got missed for 18 years. So this was found out, and we were told she needs to be served communion. So we go down there two weeks, three weeks ago. Anyway, after communion service, the, next, the Sunday after our communion service, and we go down there to serve her, and there's a gentleman there. Now, she's pretty excited about the visit, period. But the gentleman that's there, he works on just weekends taking care of the, the other people that live at, at this home. And he sees us um, coming in with this little basin and the juice and the wine. And we come in here to serve her. What is her name? Help me. Brenda. And so we're there to serve Brenda. And... Uh, he, he says, uh, and we get permission, you know, of course. We've called in advance. And he said, sure, of course you can. And then he starts telling us the story that he got served and his feet was washed one time. When was that? Well, it was about 20 years ago. He was hiking on a trail and there was a lady on the trail offering to wash people's feet as they came by. Now, I was just curious, anybody here know who, the, who she is? As far as I'm, you know who she is? That'd be pretty cool. I think she was an angel myself, you know, just trying to draw people's minds to, to the goodness of the gospel. So, but anyway, so he asked her, says, well, what is, what, what is this for? And he claims to be a messianic Jew. And, and he says, I've always re admired Seventh-day Adventist. So, Sabbath issue is off the plate, isn't it? He already believes in the Sabbath. He already believes in Christ. So there's a whole lot of hurdles already won by God in this encounter, right? But as he witnesses, Becky goes to serve Brenda, and, I, and she ha, does not have the ability to put her feet on down into the basin. So I offer to raise it up to where her feet are. And... And I guess he just is witnessing this, and he gets emotional, and he asks, can I be served? Now, we had already asked, you know, if he'd like to be, but the Spirit moved. And now he wants to be served. And I had the privilege of serving him and telling him the principles of communion and just reminding him of it, of the good news of the gospel. And he wants to have Bible studies. And we, and we went back the next Sunday. Wanda and Charles go with us because we had a breakfast engagement. Grandma's breakfast, is that the name of that place? Grand, Grandma's pancakes? Huh? Come on now, you guys know where I'm talking about. I'm, everybody's got to know where Grandma's pancakes is. I didn't know till a few weeks ago. So, But anyway, so we, after that we go over to their home. and But he's the one that says, I have questions. I have questions. So I said, well, great. So now in my mind, I've got my Bible out, and, I'm, and I've got a set of studies for him, and I, I think, I'm ready. Got my sword. Y'all are giggling because y'all been there and done that, haven't you? I'm ready. Don't, don't kid yourself. We're all in school. Right? So I said, you're the one that said you had questions. Instead of me starting something out of the blue that you already know, let's, let's fine-tune our time together. What's your question? He starts out saying, now this, I've never heard this before. He says, I've always wondered about King Solomon. Well, what about him? Well, you know, he sure was smart. And, and I said, well, let's do a s story together on Solomon. And I can't do it all tonight because that's what prayer meeting is going to be about. Now, if that ain't a commercial, I don't know what is. Okay? Okay. So, the thing is that we do this study on a part of the life of Solomon, 
And he's just in shock. And I have, he never realizes how much details is in the Word of God. Wanda and Charles, you get in the car, he said, I have never looked at that story that way. Words are stated for a reason. And I believe my God is able to preserve his word. There's a reason I just made that statement. My God is able to preserve his word. I'm not one of those to run down a rabbit trail on new junk. Or new unbelief. Thus saith the Lord is thus saith the Lord. And for me to say, oh, the King James people, they, they must have thought that way. Or they must have think, my God is able to protect his word. Okay? And, and it gets, I think, kind of funny myself when I think of the fact that the people at the time the King James Bible was written, they didn't talk that way. They didn't. You say, oh, the King James, they use a bunch of these and thous. Don't. They didn't. Nobody did. This was what was written down on the parch parchment. That's why in the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they found the book of Isaiah, it's almost word for word exactly what you have in the King James Version. You do know that, right? My God is able to protect His Word. That's why it's so easy, it should be easy, that our diet, being His Word, is that when He convicts us of His Word, we learn to act upon it. This is the Elijah message. Anybody hungry? Come to prayer meeting Wednesday night. You know, this, this should be a norm here, right? I mean, we're known in the community as people of the book. I'm excited about that. I don't have to go beyond the book to explain where I stand. They're coming to us to find out how we define the book. And all we have to do is read it. So when I read about two sticks, it's not just a whoopee doo to me. I get to talk about the gospel. And so when we talk about last day events, we're talking about a group of people defending God and His Word. So the next study, uh, just, just a for instance, the next study with this young man, guess what it's on? Because I couldn't stop with just this little story of Solomon and his wisdom. Solomon had the privilege of doing something in particular. What did he have the story privilege of doing for the Lord? Early, you said it. Building the temple. His own father desired to do it. But God enabled a way for Solomon to follow through with that. I get the privilege of bringing out the sanctuary message to him. This is our privilege as a church. That's why next Sabbath, commercial number two, next Sabbath I have a marker board up there and up here. We're going to explain where we as a movement got our start based on the sanctuary message. Amen? And for you to be able to prove it, not by scripture alone, this church is special for such a time as this, but even how the movement was taught this message from the beginning. I mean, I, I get exciting about this because our own movement is having uh, up here coming real soon, 10 days of prayer, right? So the introduction of this message, of the sanctuary message, is actually introducing a life of prayer. Do you think Elijah just went up there for years and sat on a rock? Of course not. He communed with his God. 
Why do you think Jesus prayed all night? God did that with him and, and, and his most amazing encounters were after those all-nighters of prayer. That's why Jesus was able to say, Verily, verily, I say unto you. God's already given me the answer to this issue. Why did he, the scripture say, prayer without, Pray without ceasing? Here's the patience of the saints. And I can guarantee this statement. Every one of us have learned patience. Waiting on God's timing to do his perfect work. Okay. I'm in the hospital. I have not received my first chemo treatment yet. And there's a little girl at the, the foot of my bed. She's from Romania and her parents are there visiting. Her little sister's five years old. And the little girl that's three years old is standing there and she says, in one month you'll be healed. This is my pair of glasses. Okay? In one month you'll be healed. healed. Becky speaks up and says, what did you say? And she clammed up until mom comes over and finally talks her into saying what she said again and she said in one month you'll be healed that was pretty encouraging considering my condition at the time but I had a doctor's appointment and within a few days before that doctor's appointment uh, I asked Becky for a lemon. I wanted to eat a lemon. And she said, you're not supposed to be eating anything. I said, yeah, I know, but I want a lemon. And she's, she's, I never forget this. She, she looks around the house. Now, we're the only two there. She looks around the house, and she says, well, there ain't nobody else here to see you throw up. And I said, yeah, but I want a lemon. I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought I might chew on it and end up spitting it out or spitting it up, you know, one or the other. But I, I just wanted a lemon. I had been vomiting for two months. Nothing could go down, okay? Um, this just in time for lunch, isn't it, this conversation? Okay, so... The, the, the thing is that um, she went and got me one. She said, it was your decision. So I peeled it like I would an orange and took the sections and ate it. I didn't taste it. Now, I have to... I had received my first chemo here. I had, and so it had affected my taste buds. I couldn't taste it. And, and I, I know that's weird. But I could tell the texture, and I knew I had a lemon in my mouth, but that was as far as it went. But I was so determined, and I enjoyed that so much, that I got up in the middle of the night, unhooked myself from my tubes, went and got me another lemon that night. But come to find out, a lemon is, uh, what, what is... What is that word? For? It's alkaline once you take it in, and then what? Acidic when you take it in, but it turns into alkaline. And it's anti-cancer uh, agent. I didn't know all this detail. All I know is I had a taste for a lemon. When God says to you, eat a lemon. 
Okay. And he took away the bitterness so that I could accomplish it. That's what gets exciting to me personally. Because within a few days, I thought, you know, there's lemons in guacamole. See, with God, you always think positively, right? So guess what was next on my list to try? God is good. And so after a few days of lemons and guacamole, I got this doctor's appointment. And he says, uh, you're eating? Yes, sir. And uh, you want to get these tubes out? Yes, sir. I done stepped on one of them and pulled it out myself one time. That's another story. And he said, well, let's, let's get them out then. So Becky's on my phone because a church member had called, and, and I'm, I'm watching the nurse preparing to pull these tubes out of my sides. And I start counting the days. And I lean toward Becky. I said, 31 days. That little girl had said, in one month you'll be healed. And in 31 days, I was eating, and my tubes were being pulled out, and I was shouting hallelujah. And still to this day, you might be asked to do some of the strangest stuff. But there's somebody there waiting to hear about him there's somebody there waiting to have their feet washed there's somebody there willing to hear the story of a little girl the testimony of a three year old there's somebody there that needs to know about God This is the reason we are here. This is the reason why we have the Elijah message. This is the reason why I'm just making a proposal to you today to have a New Year's resolution that's out of this world. Would you like to have the mind of Christ daily? Not just to consider it one day a week. Oh, I can't wait to go to church next week because the pastor's going to remind me of what I need. Why don't we just claim it today and every day? Because the song we're about to sing ends with us claiming. I'll be talking more about this, okay? Us claiming a sealed mind and I'm not talking about somebody that is naturally stubborn or somebody that's naturally set in their ways and you can do nothing to change the way they think and the way they reason I'm not talking about that I'm talking about a sealed mind with the mind of Christ settled in now that's a mind at peace that's a mind filled with joy. That no matter the brook Cherith, no matter the Zarephus, no matter the calling, we just respond anticipating whatever is about to happen is about saving my soul. Because we have nothing to fear but fear itself. 